So welcome to the fifth in the series of the TIC IPM uh, Toolbox webinar series. I'm y Jana Hexter. I work with the Northeastern IPM Center. And uh, welcome to, it's a beautiful sunny day here in upstate New York, and I hope it's uh, lovely where you are. Um, so I'm delighted to be introducing a host of folks today for our presentation. I'm going to be talking about pathogens found in ticks collected on school grounds in public parks. So I'm just going to go through a few things before uh, we dive into the presentation. Um, so the, this is being recorded and anyone who is registered for the webinar will get a copy of the recording. I'll email that out. It takes us about a week to edit it and uh, post it on our website and send you the link. So um, you should hear from me sometime early next week with the link. And um, so if you can't watch this entire webinar, you can feel free to log off and you'll be able to watch the recording later. We welcome your questions. In fact, we have lots of space um, allotted for questions during this. And we ask you to do it in a particular way. So do not use the chat feature. Um, but if you slide your mouse over Zoom, you'll see that little box that appears at the top or the bottom. And in the middle of that, there is a box with sort of two little um, speech bubbles that says Q&A. And if you click on there, you can um, ask your question. And you can ask your question anonymously if you prefer, or you can uh, leave your name there. Um, we do it this way so that we can keep track of all the questions. So if we have three people asking the same kind of question, we can go through and ask that question and then mark them all answered. And um, it helps us keep track of things when there are a lot of questions coming in, which happens sometimes on our webinars. Um, so feel free, anytime anything pops up, just uh, put a question in there. And also our uh, speakers today will be monitoring the questions. So some people, um, if there's maybe a link they want to give you as an answer, they can pop that in there too. And um, we will give a copy of the um, answered questions along with the recording. We have three presenters for you today, um, and I will introduce each one of them. So our first presenter is Dr. Matt Fry. He's an extension educator with the New York State I Integrated Pest Management Program at Cornell University. He provides education and conducts research related to pest management in and around buildings. Matt has worked as an urban entomologist in the pest management industry before joining the IPM program. So welcome, Matt. And uh, Jody, Dr. Jody Gangloff Kaufman is an entomologist and senior extension associate, also with the New York State IPM program at Cornell. Jody and her colleagues promote IPM based solutions for pests in homes, workplaces, parks, golf courses, schools, and a wide variety of other places. She chaired the New York City Bedbug Advisory Board, co leads a working group called the Scientific Coalition of Pest Exclusion, SCOP. So, welcome, Jody. And our third uh, speaker today is Dr. Laura Goodman. She's an emerging infectious disease researcher at the Cornell College of Veterinary Medicine. Her work has investigated mechanisms of pathogen emergence and development of novel, novel high um, throughput testing methods. Her research takes a One Health perspective on pathogen discovery and surveillance with specific focus areas on tick-borne disease and antimicrobial resistance. So welcome, Laura. All right, um, so uh, before we begin uh, with uh, the presentation, we just have a few questions for you. And um, they are not um, hard questions. <laughs> it's really just a survey for us uh, to get an idea of who is here and what kind of level of information and knowledge that you have already. And it helps us tailor the presentation. Sometimes we have you know, lots of uh, researchers on the call. Sometimes we have lots of people from the general public and doing this helps us to be able to see who's here and how we need to uh, speak during the presentation. And um, we'll also be asking these questions at the end. So I'm just going to be quiet for um, a couple of minutes and uh, to give you a chance to answer the questions. And you can't um, hit submit until you've answered all of them. Um, there is a certain setup um, involving iPads where the poll doesn't show up for some people. So if you're not seeing a poll on your screen, that might be you and uh, don't worry about it. Um, it's been happening during this webinar series and we're not entirely sure what the combination is. So I'll be quiet for a moment. 
I'm going to share the results with you. You hopefully will be able to see that. So um, most people are moderately or somewhat knowledgeable about tick distribution in New York State. Um, and most people are somewhat or moderately knowledgeable about the risk of tick-borne pathogens on school grounds and public parks. Quite a few people are very knowledgeable, actually, so we've got a good mix here. And 20% um, uh, of you are not at all knowledgeable about the Don't Tick, uh, Get Ticked New York campaign. So you are going to learn something in this, uh, in this presentation for sure. So uh, with that, I am going to um, move the uh, presentation over to Dr. Matt Fry, and he's going to share with you about the Don't Get Ticked New York campaign. And then the second part of the presentation is going to be covering um, research that uh, Drs. Goodman and uh, Gangloff Kaufman have been uh, conducting of late. So uh, there you go, Matt, up to you. Great. Thank you, Jana. So um, it's nice to see that a lot of people haven't heard about our campaign. So this is a good opportunity for me to sort of cover the the basics of what we have created and more importantly is the justification for why we created this. So let me see if I can advance the slides. Hmm. Of course this time, Yana, I'm not able to move the slides. There we go. Okay. So I wanted to start with a little background about our campaign um, and involvement with tick education and research. Um, so our program, the Community IPM program, deals with pests that occur in and around buildings. And in 2014, we started to receive calls from stakeholders asking if we could provide information about ticks and tick management. Um, so at that point is when we started to review the literature and ev evaluate what outreach efforts were currently available that we could use to reach out to our stakeholders. Okay, um, next slide. So what we discovered in this process was that um, and I'm using this term lightly, is that tick outreach efforts were inaccessible to key audiences. And what I mean by that is that a lot of the resources that are available are extremely text heavy. So it's either a booklet or a several page document that requires in-depth reading and interpretation of the information to boil down to the key uh, preventative measures and information about uh, disease transmission and tick-borne disease. So some of this, you know, because of that extent is overwhelming. What we also found was that with the exception of one or two programs that were on social media, uh, most of this information has to actually be retrieved. So someone would have to actively go and find information about ticks. And the, the problem with this is that it misses some of the key audiences who are parents that may not know that they need to know about ticks. So we were interested in making this information available to members of the public that are not necessarily looking for tick information. Next slide, please. One of the things that came up in our search of the literature is that there are, and, and the information that's available to the public is that there are numerous misconceptions about ticks and tick-borne disease. And these are just a few highlights of my favorite examples is the numerous types of tick removal techniques that haven't been evaluated that are promoted on websites and the um, overwhelming misidentification of any crawling organism as a tick. And you can see this uh, particular Facebook post here on the left um, looking at what is actually a mite, but several people very confidently concluding that it's a tick. And this may have uh, negative consequences if someone was concerned about tick-borne disease, they may take steps to going to the emergency room or their physician, when really from this organism there's no harm. Next slide. And further, um, I did a little bit of um, asking around to my family and friends on social media about people's prevention. So we know that 
uh, prevention is possible. We know that there's a number of techniques that are available that people can use to reduce their encounters with ticks. But we also know that strategies are often ignored or overlooked. And so I polled friends and family, why? What are the reasons that you, you don't do this? So everything from being too lazy to forgetting. Um, one person, I'm too hairy. I'm not going to find a tick on my body. So our conclusion from this information is that we need to create information that is easily incorporated into someone's everyday life so that um, it's easy for them to perform a tick check and do other activities that will help uh, reduce their incidence of tick-borne disease. Next slide. So we did this um, initial search to create educational information and we were fortunate to receive funding from the Senate Task Force on Ticks and Tick-Borne Disease in 2017. Um, at that time, the committee was chaired by Senator Sue Serino and funds were provided to create a tick outreach and education program. So at that time, we um, developed this campaign that I'll, I'll run through today uh, called Don't Get Ticked New York. And our goal with this campaign was to create information that would reduce human exposure to ticks and tick-borne disease, and then also to promote integrated pest management of ticks using techniques to uh, monitor for ticks before taking any interventions uh, to incorporate personal protection into the daily lives of people that may be exposed to ticks and to work towards some best management practices for uh, tick avoidance. Our ultimate goal is to make this as easy to understand and accomplish as possible. Next slide. So one of the first things that we did was to create a website and um, our URL for this is available at the top here, don'tgettickednewyork.org. Um, the capitals there are just for emphasis. It doesn't matter if it's all lowercase or capitals. And this is really our landing page. From here, you can find all the information, all the infographics that we've created that I'll discuss in a moment. But this is our, our landing page with everything that's available. On the main page, we have a claymation video. Um, that's, you know, it's a little bit, interesting to see claymation. It's not just a typical YouTube video, so it's a little more engaging, especially for children. We have a 53 question frequently asked document, which um, helps to dispel some of the myths about ticks and tick-borne disease. And we link to our blog posts that are um, on various topics related to ticks and tick management. Next slide. One of the key outputs of this campaign has been our tick identification card. And in the three years since we initiated the campaign, we've given away thousands and thousands of tick identification cards. The benefit of this is that it provides information to stakeholders throughout New York and also other parts of the Northeast about the three common ticks that we see that are a cause for concern with tick-borne disease. We provide the various life stages and the, or the, um, the size of those organisms and provide information about conducting a daily tick check, how to remove an embedded tick, and what to do if you've been bitten. Next slide. Uh, these cards are available in English and Spanish. So for, for Spanish-speaking audiences, we have the same information available. Next slide. One of our key outputs from this campaign has been infographic posters. And our idea with this uh, design is instead of having a text heavy document that requires someone to read through to obtain those one to two key ideas for protection or prevention, these are image based and um, make the information more accessible to diverse audiences, whether that is people with low literacy or individuals with English as a second language. Using images can um, communicate ideas without requiring the interpretation of text. Because they're image-based, perhaps they capture more interest than the text-based documents and it's less work to understand the concept. So next slide. We have, and I'm gonna zip through these, uh, we have infographic on daily tick check. So this was our first one uh, showing a lady in the garden, but we have others that relate to different target audiences to be more appealing. So next slide. 
Here we have one for farmers, hunters, and school-aged children. It's all the same information, but the idea is to appeal to different audiences because all of these individuals are um, potentially exposed to ticks in their daily lives. Next slide. We have an infographic that talks about where are the ticks. And this one's important to us because many people think, oh, I'm not an outdoors person. I'm not exposed to ticks. But in reality, many of the things that we do as part of our regular habits, going for a walk, a bike ride, uh, hiking, fishing, bird watching, playing sports, all of these things can potentially expose people to ticks and tick-borne disease. So the goal here is to communicate that risk in common environments. Next slide. We also have um, information about protecting yourself in terms of clothing treatments using permethrin. Um, this infographic I've found particularly useful because many people have not heard of permethrin treated clothing. And this provides information about the various ways clothing can be protected, whether it's the do it yourself type where you um, apply the product to your own clothing or you purchase clothing that is previously treated or you ship out your own clothing. Next slide. We also have information on repellent use. So why do we want to use repellents? Because it helps um, make you less um, obvious to ticks, it makes you harder to smell. So uh, we talk about the types of products that are available to use as repellents that have documented efficacy and how they can be applied. Next slide. Uh, we mentioned also about pet protection because many people believe that pets only need to be treated at certain times of the year, but the risk is prevalent throughout the year. So we want people to provide tick protection all year long. Next slide. And how do we monitor for ticks? What can be done on a school property? What can be done on a personal property to document or verify whether ticks are present? This could be useful for the pest management industry, for example, if they're not documenting or monitoring for ticks before they provide a treatment, but can be also useful, be useful for homeowners that want to check and determine if they have ticks on their property. We also provide a recommendation for minimizing ticks in the schoolyard. Uh, we have similar um, documents that talk about private property as well. Next slide. Our final infographic is about protecting campers um, and is intended for parents that are gonna be sending their kids off to camp. Obviously this was a wash for 2020 because many uh, camps were closed for the summer, but this information provides some of the tips and techniques that can be used to reduce the risk of exposure to ticks while children are away at camp. Next slide. Another product of our campaign um, are tick removal kits. And these of course have been extremely popular. This is all made with funding from uh, the Senate task force. So these were provided for free to um, stakeholders. And in return, we just asked them to fill out a survey that I'll talk about the results in a second. But in the tick kit, um, the tick kit was actually made of neoprene with a carabiner. So it could be hooked to a bag or um, loop on a belt included a pair of sharp forceps, which are one of the best ways to remove ticks, an alcohol pad to sanitize a wound if a tick, an embedded tick has been removed, a tick identification card to determine what tick species was present, a magnifying glass to help with that identification, and then a small compact mirror to look in those places that may be difficult to see, such as behind your knee or in your armpit. Next slide. So one of the questions that we asked was, have you removed an embedded tick in the past? And the overwhelming majority of people said yes, about 83%. Um, and when we asked what they used to do it, um, here are our results here. So you know, upwards of over 200 people went to the doctor for tick removal when a pair of pointy tweezers could have been used at home. Other techniques that we see are things that are available on the internet for purchase and a lot of the the techniques that we are in question about whether they're effective at removing ticks without increasing risk. So tick spoons, tick keys, tick twisters, and tornadoes. Um, the use of petroleum oil, burning. This is surprising to see that many people <laughs> used heat to try and burn a tick off their body, fingers, and have never removed a tick. 
So there are definitely opportunities for us to improve how people remove ticks. Next slide. Uh, what avoidance techniques can be used? We're pleased at these results to see so many people are doing daily tick checks, are showering after they're outdoors. Um, but we do see an opportunity here to educate people about um, heating clothes and the dryer after being outdoors, which can kill ticks, as well as uh, treating clothing with permethrin. Next slide. So this is just highlighting um, that this is an opportunity for us to improve um, prevention through permethrin treated clothing. Next slide. And then finally, um, again encouraging, do you plan to change your tick avoidance or tick removal behavior as a result of what you've learned? And many people said that they were. So through our presentations and through discussions about the tick kit, um, people are willing to change their behaviors to reduce their uh, risk of exposure to ticks. Next slide. Another product of the Don't Get Tick New York campaign are education kits. And these were provided to Cornell Cooperative Extension offices in New York State. Um, each kit contained a sample of tick vials that had the three common um, tick species in New York. At this point, we probably should be including the Asian longhorn tick, but our collections haven't produced enough adults um, or nymphs to um, include in these kits. We include the always popular tick bagels, which is a poppy seed bagel with ideally black-legged tick nymphs attached. Um, and the goal with this outreach item is to help people get a good search image for what that stage and um, identity of tick looks like. So it helps to let children, for example, recognize a tick that's attached to their body. And the same is true of using tick tattoos. The goal with these is to put them on a child's body, say in their armpit, and then have the parent try and find that tick on their body. Next slide. Oh, and there's our tick. Okay, next slide. Another um, product that we created this year, so it hasn't really been distributed because of COVID, are um, window clings and mirror clings. And the goal with these two items is to put prompts for a tick check in places or at critical times during someone's day to be reminded about a tick check. So the window cling, for example, could be attached to the car window. So as you're coming back to the vehicle after a hike or other outdoor activity, you're reminded to do a tick check as well as a mirror cling in the bathroom so that when you're getting into the shower or coming out of the shower, you're prompted to do a tick check. Next slide. And uh, in terms of pushing information out to the public, uh, one of the things that we've done is expand our reach with YouTube videos and our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So we do have a set of about 12 uh, videos on our YouTube channel that talk about tick removal. Um, tick prevention, and we have everything from one snippet about tick prevention up to an hour worth presentation on tick integrated pest management. Next slide. We've created uh, some slide sets for various audiences to use, and in particular, we've done this for the Master Gardener volunteers um, at Cornell Cooperative Extension. Uh, these slide sets can be used to educate their constituents about tick prevention and avoidance. Next slide. Uh, we've also conducted or participated in community forums as well as monitoring workshops where our staff have worked with, for example, school grounds um, and building and grounds uh, staff to create tick drags and then demonstrate how these are used on school property. And these uh, workshops, because of the funding from the state, have been completely free to uh, provide school personnel with the tick drag and other information. Next slide. And then, um, so for the future, what we're planning to do is follow up with our survey to assess impact and guide further outreach. What have people actually done in terms of changing their behaviors to reduce their exposure to ticks? And then also focus on that key audience of um, kindergarten through 12th graders to um, help the, educate them to avoid risk of exposure to ticks and tick-borne disease. 
and this would include classroom lessons and research projects. Of course, all of this is now subject to debate whether we can actually get into classrooms to provide these types of lessons or not. But that's a goal for the future. Next slide. Um, and with that, so here's our, our social media. Um, things got a little bit wonky on this slide, but you can find our, our resources on the Don't Get Tech New York website. Um, but our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, Instagram are also available to um, provide information. And we do have a, a Flickr gallery dedicated to um, ticks and tick-borne disease where you can find and use pictures um, about, about ticks and tick-borne disease. And then I have one final slide. So um, next, our colleagues are gonna talk about this research project um, that was related to surveillance on schools and parks um, for ticks, what ticks are present, their abundance distribution and tests for pathogens. So with that, thank you very much. Great, so um, we have actually had a couple of questions, but um, um, jo Joellen has answered a couple of them. So if there's one remaining from Mark Lesher, how late in the summer or fall to, uh, season are ticks active? Great question. So there's this idea that there's a tick season and we like to say that every season is tick season. Ticks can be active all year um, and they can be moving around when the temperatures are above freezing. Now, the complication of that is if the ambient temperature is below freezing, but a, a section of vegetation is above freezing because the sun is hitting that, ticks can still be active. So even in the middle of winter, um, you can go for a hike and encounter a tick. So we like to say that you should be thinking about ticks all year round and taking precautions to avoid ticks all year round. Yep, I can corroborate that. I'm a hiker and I hike all year round. and. Sure enough, in our hiking group, we've hiked in like January and had people have several ticks on them, especially when there's a, like that warm snap, you know, and it just gets a little bit warmer. So, all right, great. Well, we will uh, move on. Thanks for the great questions and keep them coming. And uh, we will move on in the presentation. Um, and there we go. So, um, uh, Jody, I think if you want to uh, take control of the screen or I'll move it forward for you. So. Good. Hmm. Not getting control yet, but I, it took a while before. It says it's, wait, it's waiting for you to control it, so you may have to click on something. All right, well, good. We'll do the old-fashioned way. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So, thank you uh, for tuning in, and uh, I'm Jody. I, I'm the coordinator of Community IPM at Cornell, as you know, we've said, and uh, we did this part of the project uh, separate from the campaign but with money again from the um, State Senate Task Force. So next slide, please. And this is much the same information. Sue Serino has been our champion to uh, fund um, our project as well as several other projects around the state to uh, try to get at the problem of Lyme disease in humans. And she is in a district where <laughs> There are a lot of people who suffer with Lyme disease. So it's been a very good partnership. In the you know, time between 2017 and now, we have received several grants, very generous, and have been able to do a variety of projects. So next slide. Um, one of the projects we did, uh, in a way it was unintentional. Uh, we ended up with several collections of ticks from different parts of projects we were working on that we were able to put together and test. And that'll be the second part of this talk. But um, the objectives of our project out in the field, uh, first of all, were to test, to look at tick-borne disease risks using transects of school properties from the woods to the field, looking at tick abundance, and then eventually to look at tick uh, disease profiles, you know, in these collections. And um, the second part was testing of ticks that were collected in other efforts in New York State, for example, a Christmas tree uh, tick monitoring project. Um, the third 
aspect of this was to describe tick distribution in Nassau County, which amazingly had never been done. So it was a you know gray county with no data at all. Um, and then we were able to characterize the tick-borne disease risks or distribution of, of disease organisms in those ticks from Nassau County. So next slide, please. The aims, the overall goals were to improve the understanding of tick-borne pathogen prevalence on school properties. I think that's one of uh, another gap in our knowledge is how much risk could there be or would there be on school properties for kids? Where are the ticks uh, generally located? Uh, and what things we can do to modify um, activities on school grounds to prevent disease transmission to kids. And also um, the study aims to highlight the importance of active surveillance for tick-borne disease, which we know happens, but is, is, um, it does have some gaps. Anyway, so next slide. We do have some limitations on this study and mostly it became uh, limiting because of the funding. Our funding from the state was processed and in contract by October of the year and the funding ended in March. So um, this fall sampling window hindered us because you know cold weather sets in uh, and rain and snow. So our sampling for the um, Nassau County and the school IPM projects went from October 18 to December 21. It wasn't worth going beyond that because it was deep winter. And in, for that reason, what we collected was almost entirely Ixodes scapularis adults. And um, there was another limitation that schools in Nassau County are generally urban and they lack habitat and they also have high fences. <laughs> so next slide. Okay, so here is an example of a high fence. Uh, deer can't cross that fence, although deer exist on the other side of that fence. And um, we couldn't do the transect, which I will describe in a minute. Um, but we, you know, we were able to get behind that fence briefly and collect some ticks on that side. So, you know, ticks do exist in the suburban environment. Okay, next slide. So our sampling methods for this, it's a variety of different um, areas where we sampled. In the Capital District and Upper Hudson Valley, that's where we did most of the school grounds uh, sampling because the school grounds were not conducive to tick populations in Nassau County. If we work in Suffolk County, where we know a lot already about the tick populations, we might get more information. But we limited the school uh, study part to mainly the Capital Region where schools exist ne next to very large woodlots and the, you know, the conditions are perfect. Uh, we also did some collecting in state and county parks in the Hudson Valley and Long Island. We sampled public and private wildlife preserves, which were also interesting and encompassed most of or many of the uh, green spaces in Nassau County. Uh, we added ticks that were collected from this Christmas tree farm survey, and I believe that was 2017 data. Um, and then it, so overall, a total of 19 schoolyards and 32 parks were sampled. Next slide. We did have to visualize each site before going using Google Maps. So that tall fence field that I showed you before, this is the same school. It is in the eastern part of Nassau County, so a very urbanized location. But that woodlot behind it is contiguous with a, a green trail. So um, the, there were deer back there and they had access up and down sort of a vein in Long Island where um, they could roam from the North Shore to the South Shore. Okay, next slide. Our sampling method for the school transects uh, included using, of course, the one, one square yard of flannel, um, doing sampling only on days that are above 37 degrees Fahrenheit and with no rainfall. Of course, rainfall uh, plays with tick behavior in so many ways, you know, especially when combined with cooler temperatures. Um, so, well, next slide, please. Here is our school transect sampling scheme. Now, we were only able to do this work between October 23rd and November 29th because north of the Hudson Valley, even in the Hudson Valley, there was, there was snow early in the season. So um, it got too cold to continue. But this sampling scheme is something we're going to continue to use. Uh, so you see the line that has stars on it. That is our transect. And at each point of those stars, which is three yards into the woods, 
the woods edge three yards out and then six yards out, we did a sampling scheme of 20 feet in each direction, stopping at 10, I think 10 feet to check the drags and um, to try to understand the distribution of ticks at this time of year, because we didn't have any choice in the time of year. Um, and uh, maybe to, to understand how far out into an athletic field ticks could go. We recorded the date, time, temperature, humidity, cloud cover, previous rainfall. We did a few of these on Long Island, but it was um, late October and it was very dry and too warm. So we didn't collect any ticks. In the um, Capital District and the Hudson Valley, again, we fell short of collecting many ticks on the days when we did the sampling because of the weather, which was much colder up in um, the Albany region than Long Island. So uh, we tend to, we intend to use this scheme um, at different times of the year when we can catch lone star ticks, when we can look at dog ticks, and when we can work in Suffolk County as well as up in Albany because Suffolk County has more lone star ticks than the capital region. Okay, next slide. So the sampling methods for HUD, the Hudson Valley and uh, Nassau County parks and preserves are much the same. We use the square yard flannel uh, tick drag. And in Nassau County, the, it was its entirely own project. We intended to document the presence or absence of ticks in these parks and preserves in all the green spaces in Nassau County because it had not been done. So we didn't know exactly where ticks would be. And we were not looking for abundance because it's very difficult to gauge abundance using a tick drag. Um, but we, we did a lot of walking in parks and preserves along pathways and into the brush. We sampled almost all of Nassau County's wooded parks and a few Hudson Valley locations as well. The Hudson Valley turned up lower tick collections again from the weather. And it's amazing to, um, to see how, how much the weather varies in New York State or how much the climate does. Okay, so next slide. So in the Nassau County sampling, um, many locations lack ticks. As you can see, the zeros on the map here show locations where no ticks were found. It doesn't mean they aren't there, but we did not find um, ticks at that time. But many other places were loaded with ticks. The deer uh, and wildlife that we found or we saw evidence of, or we asked you know, locals and um, regulars in these parks about uh, what they saw, we were able to collect anecdotal evidence of the presence of deer, um, even coyotes, although it didn't play into this, and uh, river otters. So uh, that was uh, you know, exciting. And deer are way more abundant than is obvious in Nassau County, including in preserves where people say, I've never seen a deer. And the ranger says, there are definitely deer here. They're just quiet. Um, you can see the numbers get very high up in the, the upper part of this map. 155 that was found in a preserve called Shoe Swamp, which is really a beautiful park, but it's very wet and it does have deer. And either 66 or 54, I think it's the 66 number, is up at Sagamore Hill, which is a federal park. It's the home of Teddy Roosevelt. And that is an interesting location, as you'll hear from Dr. Goodman, because we found a lot of disease out there. So, okay, next slide. As you can imagine, um, greener spaces have more ticks. So most of our tick collections were in these greener spaces in Nassau County. If you go south toward Jones Beach and the marshy areas of the south shore of Long Island, we were not finding many ticks at all. And typically what you find there are dog ticks. So it wasn't even the season to find them. But many neighborhoods can't support large wildlife. So next slide. Okay, just an example of a neighborhood that will not support large mammals. Okay, except humans. Next slide. So the takeaway from this preliminary surveillance work, I guess, hit the button again. Did I? Nope. All right, I'm back. <laughs> the, I don't know why it's not displaying. It should display this. Uh, the takeaways are that. Um, we should be doing surveillance in urban areas, including New York City and its outer boroughs, because uh, the number of people in those locations warrants knowing about tick distribution. 
even though not everyone goes out into parks and uh, preserves, the likelihood of people picking up ticks in those areas is greater than we know. It's greater than we assume. And a lot of the people we met on these trails really were not aware of ticks. We were able to hand out a tick ID card to a lot of different people we encountered here. Um, I think the surveillance work uh, needs to continue in Nassau uh, to you know, describe the distribution of Lone Star ticks because they have their own um, risks associated. And um, we will continue the school transect work uh, as soon as we can, maybe with funding, maybe without, but we need to incorporate uh, Lone Star ticks and any other even Asian longhorn ticks in those uh, transects of school grounds. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Goodman to finish the story because the data that she found. Okay, actually, we have one question that's uh, popped up. Uh, Stephen Braymar has asked, um, how is your school program linked to the state tick study program? Um, the only way it's linked, because they were two separate projects, uh, it, it, is that we pulled the data in the disease research and we pulled the data from uh, the Christmas tree project as well. Um, so we could have um, just more information about disease distribution in uh, New York State. Okay, great. And um, we have a question, excuse me for butchering your name, but um, Abdel Gaha Al-Kishi, um, who I believe is calling in from South Africa, mm -hmm. um, asked, um, is the environmental condition different between the North and South, regardless of the ve vegetation? Um, north and south of the state or <laughs> the shores? Uh, I'm assuming he means the north and south of the island, but oh. you can, uh, Abdel Kafar, maybe you can uh, clarify that. So the state, yeah. okay, state. Oh, it is the state. So um, New York State has such a wide variety of climate and oh. with that comes different, um, you know, vegetation. For the most part, uh, parts of Long Island have the same vegetation as parts of upstate New York, but Long Island tends to be warmer. It is a totally um, warmer, you know, growing zone, a USDA growing zone compared to the rest of the state. And so the farther north you get, the um, colder and more, uh, you get into the Adirondacks and you have some boreal, you know, environments there, but that's not where you find ticks. So generally, yes, the vegetation is the same, but there are different ecosystems and eco tones here on Long Island than there are in the upstate regions. Thank you. And Mark Lasher asked, why are some school officials uncooperative? Mm, that was true. Um, why? Because it's always about parents and perception. And so if and there were times when we asked a school to come and uh, sample on their grounds and they said no, because they don't want the parents to think there's a tick problem. You know whether or not there is doesn't always matter so we have a lot of work to do to get schools on board with um, tick monitoring and uh, we work a lot with schools in IPM as it is so this is a natural extension of what we do and hopefully we'll get more you know superintendents on board with this idea of monitoring for ticks. Great thank you very much so um I see that uh, Laura should be uh, controlling the screen, so I will turn it over to Laura. All right, I guess we practiced this, but it's not working very well, so I will just move ahead. There we go. Okay, okay, okay. so I will, um, I'll just take, turn that off just so we're not fighting over it. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, Jody, for that great introduction, and Yana. And so we've been working with our um, IPM program and this team for a few years now to try to understand the pathogen, uh, tick-borne pathogen prevalence and the ticks that they've been collecting. So you can go ahead to the next slide. So first we have to get at the genetic material of the pathogens and we do a two-phase homogenization where we first crack the exoskeleton with a hollow brass bead and then we do a finer lysis to, to really get everything into solution. And uh, uh, in my lab, we specialize in uh, developing high throughput methods for pathogen testing. And so in this case, we were looking at uh, DNA and RNA pathogens using a, a nanochip array that can perform more than 2000 PCR tests here on 
uh, a plate that is about the size of a microscope slide. And uh, we will um, really, uh, this is the first real uh, published study where we've used this array and we're really excited to apply it to this uh, research question. So next slide. So we were able to do uh, counting level prevalence on some of the combined data. And we did that um, and did compare it to what the state had collected for those counties that the state does monitor. And we were able to do some stats when we had enough uh, sample numbers. So we looked at life stage uh, and uh, sex for the adults, and then also habitat um, where we were in proximity to the woods. Next slide. So we had a total of 769 ticks that we looked at for this study. And as Jody mentioned, uh, we the vast majority of these were adults. The only NIMS that we had were from the previous year from um, one of the other studies, so not from schools. Um, so we did have some NIMS as part of this study, but where, where we're talking about the schools, it's um, almost all adults. Uh, next slide. So these maps show you the locations of the ticks that were collected with the number of ticks positive for any pathogen indicated in color. And so the, um, the circles are 2018, the stars are 2017. Green means no pathogens, so there were ticks, but no pathogens. And then yellow, red, and orange and red mean that there were more ticks that were positive for at least one pathogen. Uh, next slide, oh, uh, next slide, please. So the, the most common agent that we detected was Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent of Lyme, which is not a surprise. Although um, the co-infection rates of Lyme with other pathogens were as high as 36%. So on here, we show um, just from 2018, so primarily the, the school study, and um, we compare here actually the data from this study. So the, this study is in blue, and then the orange is data from uh, state active surveillance, which they have been doing for quite some time and have a very good program. Um, it just hasn't happened to cover um, some of the areas that we focused on here. So NASA and Queens, um, this was our first real active surveillance data. And, and we see that at least half the ticks were positive for the causative agent of Lyme. Next slide. And so this is a Babesia microti. And as you would expect, um, prevalence is a lot lower, but we did detect it. Um, and uh, there, was, there was a little bit in NASA um, and some of the other counties, um, but um, you know, prevalence roughly comparable to, to what has been seen in, in state surveillance. Uh, next slide. And then um, the, the next big one that we were concerned about is anaple anaplasma phagocytophilum. And uh, this one was much lower. Um, and although we had uh, prevalences that looked higher in some counties, um, that was also just because we hadn't had as many ticks collected. So um, overall, we, you know, we did see um, anaplasma, but not as much in the areas we were focusing on. Uh, next slide. And then um, one, um, you, you could say emerging pathogen in our area is Borrelia miyamotai, uh, the cause of uh, Borrelia miyamotai disease, which is, is similar to Lyme disease, but um, different in important clinical respects. And uh, we, we do see that agent not only um, in the area studied, but even as far up as where we are here in Ithaca. So that is um, another concerning one because it's, it can be difficult to differentiate um, from Lyme. It's uh, uh, genetically more similar. And so we did see this one um, in a few different counties. Uh, next slide. And so we well, first wanted to assess the um, difference in life stages. And so as is not a big surprise, we had a much higher pathogen prevalence in adults than we had in NIMS. And um, you know, although it's you know, certainly very important to look at NIMS for, for active surveillance, uh, really adults are also you know, a very uh, significant risk. Uh, next slide. 
Then um, between males and females, there, there was no difference in uh, pathogen carriage. Uh, next slide. So here's the one we're really, you know, what, the question we were most interested in. And we ended up uh, combining the three and six meters samplings from the woods edge. And so when, um, it, in order to have enough uh, sample numbers to, to do the statistics, so if you compare the turf, the edge, and the woods, statistically there was no difference in the pathogen prevalence that was observed. Uh, next slide. So another um, concerning finding that we had was the presence of Powassan virus uh, in Nassau County. So we had 2%, uh, about 2% prevalence, both in Nassau and Rensselaer counties. And um, the 15 ticks that we collected in Nassau, um, we were able to type 13 of those as belonging to the deer tick virus lineage or lineage two of Powassan virus, which is the one that we more commonly see. And um, the, the, there's been about 20 cases of, of this of Powassan virus disease in New York State over the past decade. So we were you know, really concerned to, to find it in this area, which previously had just been a complete gray area, as Jody mentioned. Uh, next slide. And uh, another aspect of this study, which I think is also important to point out, is we did find the invasive Asian longhorn tick, or Haemaphysalis longicornis, in the study. And in fact, um, in the June 17 sampling, we uh, were able to identify the first uh, Haemaphysalis longicornis to be detected in New York State as, as part of one of our um, IPM projects. And so here, um, and there have been a number now, a number of these modeling studies that are quite alarming, uh, showing that um, there, there's quite a big geographic range we think that these ticks are going to be able to establish themselves in, and that they potentially could be a risk not only to um, people, but also to uh, wildlife and to agricultural animals. And we've tested about 1,500 of these um, from New York State collections so far in partnership with the Northeast Regional Center of Excellence uh, for Vector-Borne Diseases. And we have thus far not found any positive for pathogens in New York State. And so next slide. So in, in uh, summary, really, our, our, our project shows the importance of academic and public partnerships and um, in, in assessing the risk for tick-borne pathogens in these particular areas. Um, we did have a high prevalence of the agent of Lyme um, in, and also the presence of Powassan virus in Nassau County. Um, we, we saw that it's you know, just as important to be concerned about ticks um, into the turf as it is in the woods and that um, really these um, coordinated surveillance activities are, are really needed. Next slide. And so we have, we'll make this available. Um, the study we just presented is uh, freely available on the internet um, and, and we'll paste this link in in case anybody wants to look at more details. And then um, I can leave this up. Uh, these are uh, all the people who participated. Um, we were fortunate to have our Masters of Public Health student, um, Chin Yuan, do a lot of the analysis for this study. Um, and then, um, as uh, Jody mentioned, very fortunate to have funding from the Senate Task Force. So I will take any questions. Perfect. I was going to say we have a couple of questions. Uh, Stephen Breimer asked, uh, can you include more details on your DNA analysis techniques in the webinar presentations that will be mailed to, uh, emailed to people? Or I don't know if there's more detail that you can describe now. So that was a request for more detail. <laughs> Absolutely. I, and I'd also be really happy to talk offline. And so uh, we, uh, you know, just really briefly, we, um, after we homogenize the ticks, we purify the DNA and RNA using a, a high throughput automated procedure on a robotic uh, machine. And then um, er, there's a a uh, platform that we use where we have a customized um, nanochip uh, fabricated specifically for um, our for my research. 
And I have all the details of that on the paper. And so all the particular pathogens that we tested for and, and then all the lab methods are, are, are freely uh, open access. So anybody could, could reproduce this um, if they have the, the right machines. And so I would encourage you to take a look at the, the paper. And if they have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me. Okay, terrific. And I see uh, there's some activity on the chat. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A because I'm not looking at the chat. <laughs> um, so Jill Auerbach asked, uh, what have you heard about the soft bodied bat tick that was recently discovered? Does anyone have a response to that question? Looks like no. <laughs> Other than it, that it was discovered um, that it's, it was one of the um, NEVBD partners who uh, reported that, but it wasn't part of this study. So I don't have any other comments on that one. Okay. All right. Um, and um, the, um, so have you collected any exocuchii, uh, which is the primary vector of Powassan uh, virus? We did not find any kukii in this study. Um, I, I think if you look on some of the other citizen, the citizen science pages, um, you, you will see some that are detected in New York, but um, it, it did not come up here. I think typically those would be found more in the deep woods um, and not, not so much the areas that we were focusing on. Great, okay. And uh, Maputi Betty Ledwada, uh, who is the person from South Africa, she asked, uh, can you please give more details on the statistical analysis of the results? Sure. It, it was just um, Fisher's exact test uh, on most of these. There were a few different statistical tests um, that were used. And I think, uh, I guess, so depending on which of the questions, I would maybe, again, refer you back to the, the paper. And then, and then please do feel free if you, if you have questions about those. Um, but the um, bottom line was that the, we, couldn't, we couldn't run a lot of statistical tests because of the numbers that we were working with. And so we did our best to um, be able to look at statistical relationships. But as Jody mentioned, really, we were just, in some of these counties, trying to get an initial look at what the picture is. And certainly future studies could get more into things such as prevalence um, and um, other, other uh, questions related to management. Okay, terrific. And then Stephen Braymel said, are any reports of Asian longhorn ticks? And I believe you mentioned that in your presentation, but if there's anything to add. We just had the one in this, uh, in this study, I believe it was just one. Um, and the, uh, I would, I would refer you to any VBD. I can put their, I can put their website link. Um, and they, they have a lot of really great information on their website about um, the status of Asian longhorn tick in New York. The only other thing I could add is that so far we haven't found any pathogens in that species in New York. Terrific. And uh, Stephen, you also might want to uh, look at the recording of the uh, webinar that we did on the Asian longhorn tick um, in July. So or maybe early August, I believe, with uh, Dina Fonseca and uh, Matt Bickerton from uh, New Jersey. So if you haven't watched that uh, yet. So great. Well, here we, those are all the questions that folks had. And so um, we will uh, conclude with uh, the same poll that you saw the first time. We would really appreciate it if you could just take a couple of minutes and answer the poll so we can see um, what, what, has, what has worked, what hasn't worked in the presentation, how we can do things better. That would be great. So I'll be quiet for a couple of minutes. Great, so we will end the poll and I can show you the results. Um, so we have a lot of people who are moderately, uh, very extremely knowledgeable about uh, tick distribution in New York after this presentation. Um, and uh, we also um, um, uh, moderately and very knowledgeable about uh, the risk of tick-borne pathogens on school grounds. Um, and much more knowledgeable about the Don't Get Ticked New York um, uh, program. And, um, and uh, much more likely to implement uh, IPM for uh, ticks after, after this uh, presentation. 
So thank you very, very much for, uh, for, for, for joining us today. As I said, the recording will be available um, uh, next week. I'll send you an email. And if you have any questions for our presenters, um, feel, please feel free to uh, con uh, contact them. We also have a request for proposals that is uh, out on our website. Um, there's the URL there, but if you go to northeastern, uh, northeastipm.org, you'll see. Uh, the due date for proposals is uh, November 12th, which is a Thursday. Uh, so if you have a research idea that you would like to see funded, please feel free to, um, to check that out. If you want to contact uh, colleagues in the field, uh, such as our present presenters today, we have um, a site on our website where you can connect with colleagues of interest and you can post a profile and say the kind of person you're looking for, the kind of research you're looking for, if you're a farmer or um, a citizen activist, if, uh, if you're a researcher, and it's a way for people throughout the Northeast to connect with each other. Um, we have another webinar uh, coming up or two more actually, one with uh, Dr. Andrew Lee of the USDA, and he's going to be talking about host targeted tick control, what works, uh, what doesn't, and what's new. And I actually just saw the slides for that this morning. It's fascinating. And uh, then our last in the series is going to be uh, Kirby Stafford is uh, coming back to present on leaf litter and snow removal for tick reduction in early October. So that is uh, perfect uh, timing. Uh, for most of the Northeast when folks are thinking about uh, removing uh, uh, leaves and snow for the winter. And um, this is the link for the recording. And uh, finally, none of this would be possible without grant funding that we receive from uh, USDA NIFA. And uh, we appreciate um, their commitment to IPM. And uh, also want to say a deep thank you, nod of gratitude and respect to our presenters, uh, Dr. Laura Goodman and Dr. Jody Gangloff Kaufman and, um, and Matt Fry, Dr. Matt Fry, for all of the work that you have um, put into not only this presentation, but uh, a career and all the knowledge and hours and hours of study and, and uh, commitment that it's taken to build up the expertise so they could answer their questions so beautifully. So with that, um, I will conclude the presentation and uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next uh, webinars. If you'd like to um, uh, be present for the next webinars, you need to register for them each individually. Um, you have to uh, go onto our website and register for each one because just because you've registered for today does not um, carry forward to the whole series. So with that, thank you very much, everybody.